All right, everybody. And I look, I told you guys before you've been listening to the to the podcast. You've been loving the interviews. And I told you before, I'm going to stick to the streak of people I know you're going to find interesting. People I know that you're going to love because I find them interesting and I love them. And I know you're going to love them as well, especially this cat right here. Now, I started doing comedy in 1986. And when I was learning how to do comedy and I wanted to try to do comedy, there were people I watched on TV. I wanted to see who the best people were and try to figure out how the art form worked. This person, this gentleman, was one of those people who I enjoyed then and enjoy now. Mr. Scheidner, please introduce, introduce yourself to the audience. My name is Rich Scheidner. I started doing comedy in 1977, professionally in 79, and uh, I'm still doing it some fashion today. Man, it, it's it's really weird. You know, you know, people always talk about, you, know, you see people have these generational battles all the time. Generation Z sucks, <laughs> right? They stink. Yeah, I hate that. And I Generation hate that. X blows. That's my generation. They stink. They <laughs> suck. Baby boomers, they, uh, they don't know nothing. But I'll be honest with you. When I think in terms of comedy generations, I always think of comedy generations as 10 years, right? That's right. So do I. As a matter of fact, so do I. You know, I agree. It's so, not 20. The normal generation is 20, but comedy's 10 years. I totally agree with you. And so you are one generation above me stand-up wise, because I started in 86. What I wanted to find out, and that's that's why I wanted to that's why I brought up the generational thing, because I wanted to I wanted to point this out. Technically, I started during the comedy boom. So in comedy, I'm a boomer. You started <laughs> <laughs> you started right before the comedy boomer, so you're a pre-boomer. Pre boomer, <laughs> yeah, and it, true. it 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 that's astounds true. me because I like like you know you have your younger relatives. My younger relatives, my younger nephew, my nephews, literally when I told them about the days when I used to go to the record store because I love going to the record store and picking up the albums and you know, they smell the thing and talk to people and meet friends, they literally sat at the table. I'm not even kidding. Laughed me from my living room table, <laughs> followed me to the basement, and laughed at me while I was doing laundry. You went to a record store, ah, loser. I'm going, oh my god, <laughs> right? So, my generation, when I started, I didn't know what a comedy boom was because that's just what it was. You know, I want I want to find out from somebody who was actually you were a good comic before the comedy boom even started. So, what was it like for you? Doing stand up in the seventies, moving into the eighties, it had to have been because I I know what my hell gigs were like. I don't I can't even imagine what your hell gigs were like. <laughs> yeah, I would work anywhere and anything. I would do any place. The, the, that was the struggle was to find a place that I could do stand up comedy. So they have these, you know, uh, singer songwriter nights at a pub, and I was living in Washington D.C. Uh, I didn't care. At one time, uh, uh, my friend Howard Vine, who was sort of like my classmate at, at the law school, but he was also my friend you know and he was my agent at the time he <laughs> yeah, said, i got a place i got a place that there's a talent night down at the gay cabaret down mm -hmm. in southwest washington that it's 1977 <laughs> we were so clueless we thought gay cabaret like like the Flintstones, a gay old time <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, the, or the gay 90s you know or something mm -hmm. like we didn't get it you know and we get there and of course it's a gay nightclub and uh and the, and the managers run they says hey look fellas um uh, uh uh normally yeah you're right but but once a month, once a month, we do ladies night. Now, again, we're so clueless. We think ladies night. Perfect. <laughs> we'll be the only guys there. We didn't get it. Man. I I go up, but I didn't care. I would go in front of anybody, mm -hmm. I, any place. I needed the stage time. That's what you have to do, right? As a comic, you got to get stage time. Mm -hmm. So I went up from this room full of lesbians and I was bombing so bad. I mean, you know, S. Anthony, when you're when you're lowering the temperature in the room, I mean, you could just <laughs> see them just going like, and, and at one point, and Howard had to remind me, I just blurted out, I guess I'm your worst nightmare. <laughs> and I got a little bit of a laugh, but mm. I was so clueless at the time. I didn't know that was the only laugh I was going to get. I should have <laughs> taken that and thank you. Good night. Right. Oh, yeah. But that's it. But I think it's encouragement for me to do more. So I continue talking. <laughs> I won't say doing comedy because I was just talking. <laughs> and there was no laughs involved. And this woman from the audience stands up. She walks to the stage, gets up on the stage takes me by the elbow, doesn't say a word, and just leads me off the stage. <laughs> just like a mercy killing. That was it. Just, you know. And, yeah, I, and I didn't care. I'd go anywhere. And and I'd go, a friend of mine had a band down in Georgetown. They'd go and, and playing in a bar. And when the band would take a break, I'd jump on stage and try to do comedy. I'd just, anywhere. Most of my work, when I first started getting work, was opening act. Mm -hmm. a, black, a, 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 a Blues Alley. I opened up for like Tony Williams, these jazz guys. Mm -hmm. I opened up for uh, at the cellar door to buy you all these venues in, in DC, you know, I'd open up for whoever, whatever band, rock bands, jazz singers, whoever, it didn't matter. 
Now, let's not gloss. You you, you mentioned something in passing when you were telling the story. You just went, eh, law school. Eh, and then you just, you just jumped over law school. <laughs> <laughs> How the hell are you? What are you, evil Knievel? You got in your bike and jumped over law school like that? <laughs> Wait a minute. You know, you know, um, <laughs> I saw, you know, I, I, I thought it was kind of freakish. I never told anybody. I certainly wouldn't tell anybody. It's not something you tell about in stand-up comedy because mm. uh, it, it's just, you know, you're just kind of weird. Like, what are you doing here? You know, you mean, you, the, 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 so I, I wouldn't tell anybody I, I quit law school to go do comedy. And then the first time I met Franklin Ajay, mm -hmm. Franklin was opening up for Donny Hathaway. Donny Hathaway got so drunk the first show that they had to flip-flop the order, you know, and Franklin closed the second show, but he hung out. Uh, in, in between shows, um, he, he we hung out in his dressing room and he mm. talked. And he, I, I don't know how it happened. Andy Evans was a comedian who was with me at the time. Andy is mm. a DC comic, and and Andy, I get maybe blurted out. I was I I was going to law school, going to law school, and, and Frank was me too. I quit law school to do this, and mm. from then on, I was like, man, this guy's so great. <laughs> I said I don't have to worry about it, man. I, you know, I didn't tell anybody, but I I didn't feel so bad. Yeah, he's he, he 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 just like you. He's one of my favorite comics because uh, Franklin the Giant. Jesus Christ! Yeah, I mean, he said because I, I watched him easily, one of the smoothest comedians I've oh. ever seen in my life. Um, a third of my audience is about is in the uh, is in the twenty in, in in their twenties. Yeah, young yeah, people. Yeah, I want you to go yeah, look up yeah. Franklin the Giant. I want you, in fact, yeah. go back and look up. Um, he did a he did a spot on the um uh, Robert Townsend special about um. Uh, well, I don't want to spell. It. I want to mess it up because if I if I even describe the bit, it's about <laughs> sex and God and calling the name. He did, yeah. And I'm sitting there going, and it's, you're sitting there going, he's one of those. He's one of those guys where you think you're good, right? <laughs> right? I, I want to ask you this. I, this is something I, I call, uh, and excuse my language here, uh, comedic ass whipping. Um, and that's when you're sitting there and you start to get good. You start to get good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You get to the point where you know pretty much what's going to happen. When you go on stage and then you watch somebody and they send your behind right back home to the notepad <laughs> with shoe marks across <laughs> your face. I, I, I had it early on. We did not know. I was in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I was working. I met a couple of guys, Lewis Black. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's a bar open up called L. Brookman's down in southeast D.C., and all these comics gravitated to them. We were young and we don't, I don't know anybody's doing it anywhere else in the country. This is pre-internet. This is 1978, mm -hmm. 77, 78. And a friend of mine, she says, uh, you know, there are young comics doing this, their comedy clubs dedicated to this up in New York city. So she takes me up there, spend a weekend, couldn't get a catch a rising star. Couldn't get into improvisation. We went over to the comic strip mm -hmm. and you know, you're sitting there and I, and I'm, I'm sitting there going, every comedy comes up, I go, I'm funnier than this guy. I'm funnier than this guy. I'm just sitting <laughs> in my mind going, yeah, I got this guy clocked. Okay. This is no problem. I can do this. I can make it. And then the last comic goes on. His material is so good. His delivery is so smooth. It was a young Jerry Seinfeld. Uh -oh. And I went, I'm going back to DC <laughs> and do some work. And you know, it's the, 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 the you know, Gilbert Godfrey, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when I first moved to New York in 79, I had to follow him almost every night. I'm following him. So everything he would do to this guy, Tony. Oh God. Tony from yeah. Brooklyn. Tony from Brooklyn. Right. <laughs> why, why the moron throw the clock out the window? Cause he's a fucking moron. Are you listening to me? I just told you why I threw it out. He's a fucking moron. Right. He would just do these breaking down these old jokes mm -hmm. and you'd go up afterwards going, Hey, have you ever noticed? And you'd look like Tony, you'd look like a parody. <laughs> and so I, I went down to the East river one night after watching Gilbert and following him again and burned all my notebooks. I just <laughs> burned them all. I said, I got to start over. I just got comedic ass weapon is a good way of putting it. Oh, you know who gave me the worst beating I've ever had in my life. And I'm a huge big, I was a huge fan of him. Then I wasn't even on the show. This is how bad I got whooped. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing the show in Philadelphia. I'm at a show in Philadelphia. Emo Phillips shows up. <laughs> Okay, so I'm there. I'm like, oh man, I got to get down to. This. I wasn't even working that night. I said, oh, I got to know one thing. I'm definitely working that night. This is this this is incredible. I'm a huge emo fan. I have his I have his cassette in my hand. Nicest guy in the world. I'm mean, literally nicest, greatest guy, sweet guy. Signs the uh, the cassette. I know his act now because I love this guy. I knew a special. I knew his album. He goes on to the show. He does an hour and ten minutes of material that's not on the album, that's not on the special. Ripped the place in half. They add a second show. He does the second show. 
he does material that's not from the first show, not from the <laughs> HBO special, and not from the album. And I'm sitting there with my little 35 minutes thinking I'm, you know, you know, <laughs> I'm what? sitting there going, oh. <laughs> it's like, God, oh, am I even a comedian? I, I totally get it. Hold on. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Hold on a minute. Oh. <laughs> I haven't shown anybody this. Uh-oh. I can't I can't get it up there. I'm gonna to have to drop this background. Let me drop this stupid background. Mm-hmm. But um but um uh man. I was li- I, 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 I I'm gonna show you this doll. I'll show you this doll. You can't really see it. Mm-hmm. You know who that is? Can you see it? Yes. Oh my god. You know who that is? Nipsey. Yeah, I ain't Nipsey. afraid of you motherfuckers. Oh, Bernie. Bernie. Oh, okay. Because his head yeah. keeps disappearing. It's a bobblehead. It's a bobblehead. Okay, there we go. Okay, his head yeah. kept... It's like, I yeah. keep seeing the shirt. Yeah. Oh, my so, God. So before he before he, he broke out with Def Jam, I'm in Chicago working this place, the funny firm. It, sometimes mm. it ain't a matter of time. It ain't a amount of time. Ooh. And the funny firm was a lot of shows. Every week, they're doing like 14, 16 shows, right? Place mm. was packed. It was hot club. And he comes in, he's like, I, I, can I do a couple minutes of time? You know, I need to work on some stuff. Like, yeah, man, no problem, man. He only did like 10 minutes, but he he, re- he rearranged the DNA <laughs> of the audience. <laughs> I'm the headliner, and I'm like going, man, I had to dig out of all, you know, I had to dig out of Bernie for 10 minutes to get him, like, forget Bernie was there. Mm-hmm. And he comes in the next, like, I got to do 10, yeah, 10. And, he, and then he's, and we're talking afterwards. And he goes, well, I'm honest, you saw me. Too. What do you think? I think Bernie should wait till next week before you come back here. That's what I think. I, I think you make me work too hard, man. Oh, but it, he was a great, he was a great guy. But he was a guy who was so powerful. His presence was so powerful mm-hmm. that that in ten minutes he would change the he would change the audience. He would just change the audience around. Not only did he have that thing, but he was also a big dude. So, oh, no, no, phys- physically. I'm not, I'm a big guy. Bernie was much bigger than me. Yeah, so it's like, I'm sitting there going, yeah, because uh, I, 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 I was surprised at how big some, because I'm 5'8", okay? So I'm not exactly uh-huh. dunking on people, you know? <laughs> you know? And I, I ran, and usually, and, and it was really weird because I, I would see these people, and it was hard to explain to, to people that aren't comics when you get to the point where you're good at it, and then you'll see Andrew Dice Clay or Tim Allen show up, and, <laughs> you know, and you're going, oh, <laughs> you know, and you're going, oh, you know, and that, that was the weird thing. But I was I was always curious about that because I know that, like, like you said before, you started before the boom. So you had to take, you know, the first year of comedy is basically hazing. You're getting a vicious beating for, <laughs> for 365 days because you don't know what you're doing yet. Because, you, you know, what you walk into the place and the guy's yeah. wrapping a cord around his hand, standing with the microphone and can't modulate the person's voice yet and it's just a vicious beating but your beating had to be worse than my beating because the comedy boom hadn't started yet <laughs> there, were, there were no comedy clubs all over the place mm-hmm. there really weren't there were three clubs at that time in california of course i knew nothing about them mm-hmm. there were three paying co- professional comedy clubs then one open in garvin's in washington dc in mm-hmm. 1979 january 79 that's the first paying comedy club east of the mississippi wow the other ones were just in california but so there were no comedy clubs everywhere there were no showcase clubs there was new york city had three showcase clubs la had two and that was it boston there was a scene in boston ding ho mm-hmm. and we had a scene in washington dc at Elk brooklyn's there was the comedy workshop down in houston philly had the jail there were a couple oh, of clubs yeah. in chicago there were a couple <laughs> say about half a dozen cities outside of new york and la that had scenes but other than that it was you 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 made your own place look i once went into a guy at a pizza shop mm-hmm. he had a pizza place my neighborhood guy was immigrant could hardly speak English. I talked to him and let me do a comedy show there while people are eating pizza. Oh, well, <laughs> coming in, coming out. Yeah. And they were like, look at me. What is he doing? I had my friend had one of those little pig nose amps, you know, with a mic to it. I mm-hmm. just said like this little thing. I'm holding this thing up and talking. They're like, what, what is this guy? Religious nut? What is he, what is he doing? It, it was, it was Bring- I just, I'm, I'm looking for audience. I'm harassing people. I'm harassing strangers who are locked down. You, if they were stayed still for five minutes, I turned them into an audience. Oh, you, you're bringing up bad memories. I'm, I'm having bad flashbacks here, man. Because <laughs> we, I think we've all had the, uh, done the karaoke uh, microphone show. Uh, <laughs> when, yeah, yeah, and I did that. I didn't do, I didn't do the street. Charlie Barnett did that when I moved mm-hmm. to New York City. I saw Charlie Barnett. I, a friend of mine said I was broke and said, well, get down, you can get on a bus. You know, you can get down there and do shows in Washington Square Park in New York City. And, and you know, there's a lot of these entertainers down there, you know. 
I, I, I didn't have the personality, but I didn't have the knowledge ability. I'm down there and I'm, people are looking at me like, what, do you have any drugs to sell? Because I don't know what you're talking about. What do you, what do you, I'm down at, and then I look across the park and I see this crowd gathering and I can hear from across the park. I can hear the laughter. You know, you hear the laughter echoing mm-hmm. across. I said, somebody's doing something funny over there. And I go over and I look around. I can't find the guy. First day I look up, he's up in a tree. He's up on a tree limb. <laughs> and he's got names for everybody. He's got 50 people around him. And he's got every one of them named. Mm-hmm. He's got nicknames for everybody. And he's playing them like the plate spinner, man. He's just playing and playing it, doing crowd work like I've never seen. I went, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm yeah, going back in that yeah. slide. I'm looking for a club. We, <laughs> we have to. has got this thing. We got to know where to put our flower because some flowers don't go in some pots. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, no, I, didn't, I didn't have that personality, man. I didn't have it. Now, when, when the comedy boom happened, um, what what did I mean? What did you see that wave coming? Because that was a tsunami when it when it happened. It was ridiculous. No, I, I I felt it, but I didn't know at the time. Look, I'm down in the the second like playing really paid comedy club for money was the comic strip opened up in Fort Lauderdale in 1980. Mm-hmm. So I get down there with Kelly Rogers and my first wife Carol Leifer and Mark Schiff and Joe Bolster, and we're down there in a comedy condo, right? Mm-hmm. So Kelly Kelly calls me over and he says, oh, "This guy's on the phone." Whatever he asks, tell him you can do it. So the guys, I'm from Ottawa. The guys said, I've got a club up in Ottawa, Canada, and I want you to come up here and do comedy next week. Can you do two 45-minute shows, two separate 45-minute shows? At the time, I could do 25 if they bought everything I did. If they laughed at everything, it was 25. If they didn't laugh at a 15-minute show, that's what I had. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, 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 I could do that. I could do that. And so I go up there, and I pulled it off, you know. I pulled it off. I, I wrote like crazy. I did crowd work. I, I did it. And then the next, that, at the end of that week, he's paying me. He says, Get, there's a guy on the phone in Montreal wants to talk to you. Exact same thing. Can you come to Montreal? I went to Montreal. Guy, the yeah, same thing. End of the week, guy says, guy from Toronto. Which, so I walked, went out one week, right? Mm-hmm. In January of 80 or whatever it was, I came back like a month later, a headliner. I mean, that's the club started popping up like crazy. I mean, once Bill Hicks and I went out in, uh, it was in, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma or Oklahoma City, I don't know which one started first. Mm. We were supposed to do two weeks. We ended up doing six or eight weeks on the road because clubs kept opening. They kept sending us to the next club. And clubs mm. are opening like all the time. So before you got there, you were there right when it was starting to turn. You know, and it was like 86, 87. There was a just a glut. There was just so many clubs, so many comedians mm. coming into the, you know, into well, the business. Well, there was well, there was one really good comedian that came in in 1986. I'm just saying, <laughs> that guy was damn good. I'm just saying, you know <laughs> I I was completely shocked because I didn't know that that was a boom. I literally it was I was spoiled in a way because I literally there were two the, the two main comedy clubs when I started was the Comedy Works owned by Steve Young and yeah, the Comedy yeah, Factory Outlet with uh, Clay here. Right. And uh, right. I worked both I, clubs. Yeah. I can say now that I worked both clubs because you weren't supposed to back then. But um, I'm 52 now, so the hell with it. And. Uh, <laughs> You can't do anything to me now, Dan. Isn't that funny how that that happened everywhere? Everywhere that happened. If you work for them, you can't work for us. And and no one no one actually said it. They just kind of, you know, we really need you to need you to be here. Uh, (laughs) Could you put my mom down? No. You see how this have this pencil to your mom's neck? I'm just saying you might want to work this club, right? (laughs) You know. But but that was it was it was so weird because they were they were down the street and I had never I, I just remember literally i could work both of those clubs like i said i why well, like i said i can tell until now i work both clubs screw it and uh they can't do anything to me now so uh <laughs> after 30 oh, years and and there was club there, there, i worked so many south jersey bars y- you would show up and they just give you the go can you do 30 minutes I'm like yeah okay you do 30 minutes and they give you the the uh the famous comedy club owner handshake with the 75 bucks in the hand they always shook your hand <laughs> With the money in it, and I'm sitting there going, yeah, "I would have done this for free. <laughs> you just gave me seventy five bucks, uh, yeah." And it was a weird. I mean, if you fell asleep with your mouth open in 1986 and 87, when you woke up, there was a comedy club in it. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. It's so true. <laughs> you know, and I just couldn't imagine. But I gotta, I gotta ask you this. This is because, like I said, I've been a fan since the Canyon Man days. So I got, I got to, I've got to know, damn it. I've got to know you, the tonight show, you get your first tonight show spot. 
Now, kids, third of my audience, 20 somethings. When you got the Tonight Show when Johnny Carson was on it, that's like the finger of God coming down <laughs> and tapping you on the forehead. That was the real deal. There's really, you know, it's it's hard to to explain to someone who wasn't around for that what it was like when the man, the, the, you know, you know, this, you know, this this was the guy. This was Morpheus here, <laughs> you know, and and, yeah, and you know, yeah. So you get your yeah. first tonight show spot. What is it like when you're sitting there? You're doing your thing. You good. You're working. You're headliner. You know you got the skills, and then all of a sudden, you know, it was uh, Mr. McCauley was there when you when you got it right. Right. You okay. Know, I, um... 84, 84, the uh, Olympics came to Los Angeles, and I didn't want to be there. I knew it was going to be a problem with traffic, even mm-hmm. worse than normal one. Tourists in the clubs that couldn't speak English. I just smelled it coming. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to be there. So I said, I'm going back to New York City. And uh, Sam Kennison was a friend of mine at the time. And he said, I'll go with you because I've never been there before. I said, they're going to love you in New York. So we went there. And um, I was, you know, I never approached Macaulay. I never approached any of those guys because I was taught that when I first got out to Los Angeles. People said, look, don't bug those guys. They'll find you. You know, they'll they'll be watching you. And sure enough, man, I was on stage in New York improv and Macaulay had left L.A. too. He got there was nothing happened. So he said, I'm going to go to New York and see if I can find some comics there. He came there, saw me have a hot set and said, uh, I'm going to put you on a tonight show in two weeks. Let's figure out what you're going to do. Two said, weeks. Right. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it was it, man. It was August and it was like two weeks later I was on. And I tell you, it, 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 the stressful it is very stressful. I broke out in shingles. I was shingles. Oh, man. good I was Lord. 30, I was 31 years old. And I go in <laughs> to the doctor and says, how old are you, man? That's an old man's thing. I go, I got, I got some, I got some things on my mind. Wow. Oh, I mean, that has got, I mean, I'm just imagining you sitting, you're, I mean, cause like, like, like people don't, don't understand when you got that show, what that meant, you know, it's like you, yeah, it's like yeah. getting drafted into the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. It felt like you were in. You felt like you were in, and 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 you got better representation, and people start looking at you differently. You got that sort of showbiz stamp of approval. That's what it was. There were only three networks on. He was the only show on that time of night. Mm-hmm. Either watch him or you'd watch reruns on two other networks. That's all it was. Man. There was no cell phones. There was no YouTube. There was nothing <laughs> else to watch. Man. That was it. Either watched him or you 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 watched each other. You stared at each other in the living room. And nobody even dared wasting their money putting something opposite them because why spend money to watch your show get crushed? They tried. They tried over the years. They put Joey Bishop on as a talk show. They tried over the years. They put different people on to try to take him down when they thought they could. He was just the king. That's all there was to it. You know, you know, took him down was Arsenio. Arsenio showed that it was over. Arsenio came on and he he took the whole youthful demographic. And, and that made Johnny look old. And that's when they, they kind of, okay, we're going to get a successor in here. And then Leno came in. Mm-hmm. But it was Ar- Arsenio's one, his show, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Joan Rivers had tried before him. Um, and he became one of the kind of guest hosts they brought in when Joan left to sort of do it for a while. And then they gave him a, they tra- gave him his own, you know, syndicated show. And it, that's, that I did Arsenio's show. That was, you know, you used to do Johnny and nothing else. But at that time, I could do Arsenio and do Johnny. Mm-hmm. And uh, but but that's that's what showed the network that it was over for Johnny. When you when you did the, you know, because you just said shingles, because I mean that most people don't most people don't have that type of stress. They just I mean, with something that where, where there's not a physical danger to them, like if a pit bull's running towards you, that's well, scary, you know. But I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest here. The cocaine and the alcohol might have added to the stress. <laughs> The cigarettes, the cocaine, the alcohol might have added to it. I'm not sure. You know, you put a little, you put a little, uh, put a little extra in the gas tank. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes yeah. you want to win the race. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you're back, when you're backstage, I, I just because you know when you when you're playing a club, like say you go to a, you go to a different city, it's a top club, you've never played it before, you got booked, but you know what? You really, even though you got the gig because you sent the tape or somebody called, you're still auditioning for the the first show is your audition. You know that. Yeah, so yes, you're, yes, you're yes. standing there, and I know, I know it's, I've, I've stood behind curtains tens of thousands of times and looked out, going, "Okay, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, and you know, you you know how your your heart rate just drops back to normal the second you walk out there and you step because you go, "I do this. This is what I do." Right. But right. before that curtains op- oh. opens, <laughs> it's like somebody's hanging you off a ledge, and going, "I said, yeah. give me the money," but you were yeah. behind the curtain. The curtain, and you go, oh, you know, yeah. this next comic uh, coming out, a new comic. Uh. 
Uh, you Richard, can't, yeah, I, I don't remember being able to hear it. It's just a, a muffled thing, right? Mm-hmm. But you're watching, there's a guy going to pull the curtain open, and he's looking at you with that kind of like, don't mess up, man. <laughs> you know, he's kind of, I've seen a lot of guys come through here. Some of them didn't come back. You know, you open that curtain. <laughs> but it's, you're right. As soon as it open, you walk out, you start going, okay, here we go. You know, but before that, you're like, you're like that roller coaster where you're going oh, up. Man. You're like, come on, just get it up there. Let's go. Come on. Uh, I, it was, it was, it was surreal. That's what it was. Yeah. I grew up watching that show on TV. And then all of a sudden I'm there and I'm like, this is a, uh, I didn't expect it when I first started. When I first started doing it, I was just trying to get laughs. I didn't have any kind of plan. You know, man, this, the, it, <laughs> the, now you do the set. I saw the set, obviously, you know, so you smashed the place and you take your, you turn your head to the right. Okay. <laughs> right. So, what do you what do you see when you? He, I'm assuming he gave you because I saw the set, so he had to have given you the okay. Yeah, I figured he gave first, you the first set. First set, this is what you get. Right? Yeah, no, so I was lucky. I wasn't Stephen Wright, uh, Roseanne. Some people who went, I don't know if Roseanne went to the couch, but then Stephen Wright did right to the couch. Mm-hmm. Some people go right to the couch. I was I was happy to get this. You know, mm-hmm. Rodney Dangerfield's a good. Just give me one of these. That's all I want. I'm okay, <laughs> that's all I want. So I got one of those, and I was happy. No, what? Been happier. And they go back behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. They hand me a beer. They're like, Jim McCauley's <laughs> fantastic. McCauley's happy because it's his job on the line, too. Mm-hmm. So he's so happy you killed. <laughs> Hands you a beer and they go stand over here. And so, you know, comics are on like 12 o'clock. That's, and the show is an hour long. So mm-hmm. it starts 11 30, 12 o'clock, midway point. They bring out this new comic, right? Mm-hmm. And so now I got to stand up to the side there for the next 20, 25 minutes, whatever. And wait for the shows to get over, and then 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 you're standing on the route that Johnny takes every night, the same route mm-hmm. backstage to go up to his office. So you're standing there, the particular spot they have for you to do your little meet and greet with Johnny backstage, get a picture taken, and that's it. Man, that okay. So I'm assuming if you, because I remember a friend of mine got Letterman. Uh, we were all in the contest. I got to the finals. I didn't win the contest, Bill. Anyway, uh, I know he's going to be listening. So uh, <laughs> he got Letterman. And we're all sitting. Uh, we're, we're in Philly because we, he went off to New York. I was like, okay. We, so we're all sitting there and we're watching him on the television in the bar. And we're watching him. We're, we're like, we literally looked at other people in the bar talking. Hey, 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 shut up. Our friend's on Letterman. Shut your mouth. And the whole bar, oh, your friend's on Letterman. You know, so... Did you go run off to find the television set to watch it live? Well, watch it during the recording. I, you, the improvisation in Los Angeles, the mm-hmm. improvisation in New York, both had televisions over the bar. Mm-hmm. Really, just to watch comics on the Tonight Show. Mm-hmm. That, that so that went on, and everybody shut up. So I'm at the Los Angeles Improv. And uh, everybody knows I'm going to be on. So like, you know, five of or whatever it was, they turn that TV on. Johnny Stewart comes back from commercial. Everybody in the bar shuts up <laughs> and they watch your set. And it's just surreal. Again, surreal moment. I'm watching me perform on a Tonight Show in a bar full of people who are just also watching it. And then afterwards, you know, you get your congratulations. And everybody's, you know, it's it's what everybody, it's like, it was a moment. It's like you, you're like you graduated. Like, okay, you graduated. You graduated another level. You know, the funny thing about it is the simple fact that you showed up meant you killed. Because if you bombed your ass off. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't show up. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It's like, look, Rich, yeah, we, know, we know you killed because you're here. <laughs> <laughs> he was, that guy, he, he bombed and he still showed up for the improv viewing. <laughs> hey, you guys want to see how bad I sucked about an hour ago? Check that out right uh, there. Uh, oh, no, about five hours ago. Check that out. Because hey, I just imagine how cool that was to do because I, I you know this the stuff that i did i mean it didn't hit me that millions of people were what going to see it until halfway through my set and i'm looking i'm going oh my god <laughs> it's like yeah. it's gonna be about five maybe two in the show i did was maybe too many people so i'm going oh my god you know and it's yeah. you know like with this stuff here i know a lot of people are gonna listen to this but i've been doing this for so long that it's like eh, you know it's just fun but that monster was that the thing that was that the thing that really because I know you also did HBO, and once again, youngsters, when Rich did HBO One Night Stand, <laughs> you know that that's you know that was once again that was a, that was a, a a tent post in your career, a monster. These are monster things to do. Now, 
when you did the Tonight Show, I mean, like, I'm assuming, like, when you do the Tonight Show, when you do an HBO special or something like that, much like when you go on the road, it's the greatest hits package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the Tonight Shows are weird because you pull maybe one joke from a bit, you know, or t- you, you pull these things together and kind of glue them together with these weird segues, you know, you just did <laughs> joke about water skiing and you go, hey, you know, I get my hair water skiing and uh, my dad hates it when I had long hair when I was a kid. You know, these weird segues to get into the next bit. So you're right. It was the greatest hits package. And um, I wish I had approached it differently. I wish I had approached it. It's just like another 30 minutes of tape, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, just I would do 30 minutes and just not worry so much about how everything laid out and the end and and the greatest hits package. I don't know. That's just the way it was that for the HBO thing and for the Showtime thing. And I, I, when I got the Letterman, I was a little bit better about um, being looser about, you know, just like this is a, a block. I'm just doing this block and I'm not going to worry about putting a lot of different things in greatest hits package. That's the thing that that's the problem I had when I originally went to Los Angeles and um, I was doing the laugh factory and I made the mistake of, on on one specific audition of, I want to show my diversification. I want to show how diverse I am. So I'm going to hit 85 topics in this time period and show them they don't want to see that crap. They want to go. They want to look at you and go, hey, listen, we have a sitcom. Do you fit in it or do you not fit in it? <laughs> you know, everybody makes that mistake at some point. And I, and I, I tell you on comics, if you got an audition, they say you got eight minutes, plan six. Just plant six material and let the let the other two minutes be laughter and you being personable, you being yourself. Because when you're trying to get too much in, you end up rushing everything. You don't really let your own personality come through. I made that mistake too. I've made every mistake you can possibly make. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it the funniest thing in the world when you're doing an audition like that that you don't get? And you, I gotta see. They gotta see everything I do. I gotta yeah. compress, like you said, eighty jokes in three minutes. I'm gonna show how yeah. smart I am. Yeah, you know, hey. that's all. That's all. It's all about, anyway. Speaking of the string theory, thing, the whole thing is showing how <laughs> clever I am. Aren't I clever, mommy? Ain't I clever, mommy? Aren't I clever, little boy? I've it's seen so many. Up. I've seen so many comics literally get mad at the audience when they made a reference the audience couldn't possibly get. It's like you, uh, you know, this, that, and the other. I'm going, dude. You have a master's degree in this specific subject. You're an engineer. These people ah. don't get what you're talking about <laughs> you know the only reason i got what the guy was talking about is because i'm kind of a nerd in that way but other than that i'm going dude they don't know what the hell you don't know string theory dude calm down <laughs> they <don't> know. <laughs> you gotta read the audience man you gotta read the audience some sometimes you you watch the other that's all you watch the other comics ahead of you for just get a read on the audience mm-hmm. And some nights, you know what I mean? It's just like set the mower low and cut the grass. Don't get fancy. <laughs> I just, I, nothing, I, nothing over one syllable. Everything's one syllable tonight. Oh, you, you, you've done those gigs where I've, I've done gigs where it's. It, you, I hate when I do when you do a bunch of gigs with audiences are just eating up everything you're saying. It just, it's too easy. You get cocky. You're like a team that's up three and zero in the playoffs, <laughs> and you just expect to sweep the next time, and you get blown out in front of your hometown. <laughs> And so you, you go to a place and you go, oh, yeah, they, they love everything I do. Ah. Then you go to those clubs. And this is something that comics know that audience members don't know. You can get, you can kill in a room and it can feel different. One time it's very, very easy, very fluffy, easy. And there are times when you're still, you still kill, but you realize you're dragging a boulder <laughs> to get every single laugh. From the audience perspective, from someone, if someone watching, they, they think it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's not. You, you, sometimes you, you know you go back to the room, like those disgusting comedy condos that smell like a. Uh, what's the worst comedy condo you've ever been in? I mean, I. I it's, well, there was no. There's a, a place in Palm Beach. It was. Um, it was unreal. It was really <laughs> just unreal. It was. It was like. Um, it was. It was just. It's you had that mildew stink <laughs> to it. Yeah. It had. It, it had a. Um, a swamp cooler, you know, the swamp coolers, right? oh, where it's just yeah. a fan blowing over a tank of water. Mm-hmm. It was built from old helicopter parts from Korean War. <laughs> it was just, it was noisy. It, it made noises. That I don't even think there was a toilet. I think there was a toilet seat, but it, it just, I looked down, I could see the ground on the down below it. You know, I mean, I, it just, everything just went, I don't think it was hooked up to the sewage system. And it, and it just, everything in the place stunk. It just mm-hmm. had a funky stink, you know, mildew. 
and uh, it was hot. It was a summertime, and it, there was no that, that swamp cooler. Cut it, and you know they had one of those you know twelve inch black and white televisions mm-hmm. with an antenna. You know, it was just it was unreal. It was the just the worst. It's the worst. And a and a and a guy. <laughs> I wrote this book. At, like first night, this guy comes in and and he's pounding on the door. Open the door. There's no phone in the place, right? Mm-hmm. And this guy comes in and he's bleeding from the head. He goes, hit me with a fucking ball peen hammer. Ball peen. <laughs> you know, first of all, I always love the word ball peen hammer. So I'm trying not to laugh. I'm trying. And he's bleeding. What? Some drug dealer gone bad outside. And he comes in and he wants a phone. I ain't got a phone now. He's screaming at the people outside. Ooh. I'm like, hey, listen, man. I, I feel like I live here. You know, you're going to be whatever. You know what I mean? It, it was really, it was just insane. Just insane. I actually had, I actually walked into one and this to, uh, uh, I'm not even going to say where it is. Cause I think the guy's still there. Um, and he knows what I'm talking about and he, he and uh, he might even listen to this. Um, I walk in and <laughs> it's notoriously bad and people complained about it. It was so bad by the time I got to it, I literally opened up the door, looked in and went, no, no, no. <laughs> And he felt so guilty, he actually got me a hotel room because I'm going, nah, bro. I, I, I was in a hotel room day too on this place too. Yes. Do you ever go to ones where they go, oh, you're, you're staying with at the guy's house? And oh, then you go, go I, the next room is, yeah, my mother sleeps in the next room. So don't use the bathroom between like, you know, uh, uh, seven at night and like six in the morning. Yeah, because she's up uh, in a lot, and she never closed the door. Wait a minute, I'm, your mother's living here. I'm I'm staying in a room in this guy's house. Uh, it's like I got. I, 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 I can't. Yeah, it's like I just ugh ugh. Now, oh, now I gotta ask you this because I was I watched this when it came out. <clears throat> I am comic. Yeah, I watched it when it came out, and it reminds me very much of um in in in, in a way of a Jerry Seinfeld comedian. And so far as the inside look, and so you know, because I remember Jerry yeah, was Jerry yeah. was leaving, it's and you were great, coming it's back. A great documentary. That's a great car- documentary. Yeah. And you were coming back because it. I, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no, because the thing is, I I have something very similar because I took a big break because I was trying to be ca- uh, a captain actor, and uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and there was this Never big this is big gap right in the middle, and yeah. just like anything else. Cause I'm I'm at the point I'm gonna restart doing stand up uh, next year because it was a big gap in there, and in the back of my mind I'm like oh vey because I know I was very good, but then this time goes by and you're going, you know it's almost like you you start thinking you know I can't go back in expecting people because if people expect you to be that guy immediately, you're not gonna be that guy immediately you, you know. So, you know, you know, it's going to be six months to a year of try- of becoming that guy again. So you have to take the same beating you took 30 for me, 35 years ago. And I'm going, oh, I'm not looking for I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I love stand up. But I also know the first year is going to be like, oh, yeah. Well, I used, I, the same oh. thing. 30 years, 30 years from when I first started, I tried to come back. I'd taken 13 years off. Again, we're talking about a whole nother generation coming mm-hmm. and I'm going moved in in my time off same same problem you're talking about now seinfeld was coming back after having a number one hit show on television oh, that's the same thing right but, yeah no when i retired <laughs> nobody noticed that i retired but me that's the only person noticed you know everybody just moved the place up in line they didn't even look up from their iphones they just moved up in line one step uh mr yeah, Schreiner, that's when i retired yeah i know your pain because if you think no one with you i didn't even know i retired <laughs> <laughs> You had to remind yourself that you're coming back. Right? I was like, "Yeah, didn't that say, didn't that say Anthony Thomas used to do stand up?" Oh yeah, that's right. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, know, it's just man. a weird thing because it, it's a different. It, it's weird because you you come back and you start performing and you realize just how many people you actually know because they're going, "Oh," and then, then you come back and I, I remember they there were people that I know there's going to be people that remember what I used to be able to do. <laughs> as soon as I come back out and they're going to expect that and I'm telling them right now like, um, you see that is Anthony was very very good this is Anthony is starting over again but the thing is you do have years of experience you've done the Tonight Show you've done Why Not Stand I've done some TV stuff I've been very good when you come back you know you can do it but it's just it's like having a lottery ticket and you're trying to drive to get your Powerball ticket but there's lots of traffic <laughs> you know and he's sitting there going, I got the ticket. I just, 
could you get out of the way? And that, that the stuff that's in the way is reps, memorization, timing. Reps. And it's a pain in the neck, but it's worth it because this is what you're supposed to be doing and it's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I can't wait to get back out there. Fresh laughs are fresh laughs. And once I started getting them again, it's everything that I remembered to be when I first started. Mm-hmm. It healed me. It healed me. It always has healed me. Mm-hmm. It all, you know, they, we always talk about what we give the audience, the laughter of the audience. But mm-hmm. when I hear that, that laughter, man, I am right with the world. Most of the time, I'm not right with the world. I'm a little off. I feel a little outside. Mm-hmm. But when I hear that laughter, I feel connected to people in a way I don't feel connected any other time. And so once it started happening again, but it took a while, like you said, man, I had to knock the rust off, whatever you want, whatever metaphor you want, man. I had to get the muscle built back up again. Reps, reps, reps. Yeah, that that is, and it's it's really weird because, and the young kids are like going, Grandpa, <laughs> we're having a, we're having a hard enough time finding stage for us. Now we got to deal with you. Yeah, it, I I, I can't I can't wait for somebody to say that because I'm gonna go look punk. <laughs> <laughs> I pay. I literally my time away is longer than your time in. So shut up, punk. And uh, and besides, I know just enough people where I can still get stage time. So shut up, punk. And. Uh, <laughs> You know, I was, yeah, you're right. You're right about that. That 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 was luck. There were a lot of guys who Bruce Fine and mm-hmm. and and Melinda Hill. There were a lot of people who gave me stage time when I was coming back, and I was so grateful for it. That's what's good about being a good per, being not only a good comic and a great comic, uh, but also being good to people along the way. Because I've gotten when you think about the percentage of work you've gotten from sending out tapes or doing that kind of thing versus when comics actually rep- make a phone call for you would give you some, I'm telling you, it was yeah. like 60, 40 comics. Uh, the ones that, that are, you know, I, I've made phone calls for guys recently with bookers that I knew from back in the day that remembered me. Do you know this guy? I'm like, yeah, I'll, 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 let me call you back in an hour. Yo, Jim. Yeah, he's good. Go ahead. And then wow. he just booked that's, the guy, I love that. you know, that's cause, cause like, that well, is the truth. Yeah. So, th- so they were, and so uh, that's the thing. I mean, I'm, I'm, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm admitting this in front of a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> and one of my favorite comics of all time, I'm admitting this and I'm going to say it. Part of me is scared to death, but the other 80% of me is like, give me the microphone. <laughs> give me the damn microphone. I have buckets of bits that I've written that I'm confident in. Give me the damn microphone. And I know you felt the same way. Cause you know how good, you you know the level you achieve, so you know you're capable of it. I think that's the best part about it because I'm you're not going to fail. You've already done it. You know that you're doing it because you love doing it. So that's to me, it's very zen. And so far as I just like telling jokes to, to people that they've never heard before and stories. And I like, as you said, hearing people laugh. To me, as a comic, laughter is my favorite song. I, truly, I, I always like it at the music. It's the music I love the best. Mm-hmm. Now I got to ask you this. Now we move off stand up for a little bit and we now move on to you getting married with children. Now what in the blue hell? <laughs> Cause like I said, I knew who you were from the tonight show and I'm going, is that Regina? On the married with you? Oh, okay. So how did that come about? And what kind of effect did that actually have on you? Cause that was you no, know, I mean the tonight show was one thing you got the HBO um, one, one night stand showtime. Now you're on a network television program and you're literally playing off the person the show was built around. That was, look, first of all, he's, Ed O'Neill's just a great guy. Mm-hmm. And he was a lot of fun to work with. And he was very supportive. I, you know, when I got the role, I really lost the role. I mm-hmm. mean, the, there were two guys, you know, who, who created the show. Mm-hmm. And one of them, his best buddy was up for the role that I God, he was really the guy they wanted for the role. Ah. And uh, and so we're sitting in, you know, you go to network. So when you go to network, that's now the producers come in. You've auditioned for the producers a bunch of times. Mm-hmm. Now they, they come in with a network and they're going to make the final decision. So they, they narrow it down to three comics or three mm-hmm. actors, or whatever. They narrow it down to them and we're sitting there. And, uh, and, the, and Ron Levinson and Michael Moy, the two, Mm-hmm. Uh, creators of the show come down the hallway and the actor sitting across me jumps up and runs and hugs Michael. And they're like, Hey, <laughs> and he's like, and Michael's going, you're going to love LA, man. My wife's got the room ready for you at the house. I'm like, Oh, this is over. It's done. <laughs> the guy, it's his role, man. Mm-hmm. So I didn't care. I was going to walk. And they, they came out and said, you're next. I went, All right. I didn't care. I made fun of everything. Not Fox wasn't a television 
station yet. There mm-hmm. wasn't a network yet. This was a show that was going to be on the first night of their programming Sunday night. Mm-hmm. I made fun of the fact that there was no network. I made fun of the fact everything I made fun. Of, and I was funny. I was loose. I was loose. I didn't mm-hmm. care. And then, and Fox went, well, that's the guy. <laughs> and Michael Moy, I understood Ron told me later, he fought for his buddy, but Fox had already made up their mind. I was just too funny. Mm-hmm. They put me in that role. And of course, as soon as I won that role, Michael Moy wanted to get rid of it. Yeah. So, you know, seven, seven shows in, you know, I I taped seven shows. My contract was seven of the first 13. Did the first seven. Every Friday, got the script. I go over to script on the weekend, Monday, show up for a table read. That Friday, didn't you get a script? Mm -hmm. I called my agent four or five o'clock. I go, look, I didn't get my script yet. He says, ah, delivery problem. I'll call you right back. He calls back. That is a problem. You got fired. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's the, how you find out in Hollywood. <laughs> you don't get the script. The that's fix was out. in. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You know, I had a blast doing it. I had a lot of fun. And uh, for a while, I was getting nice big residuals. I think they're down now to about 38 cents. Mm-hmm. But, you know. yeah. This is what I want to ask you. Now, you, you talked about uh, getting shingles before you audition, well, before you were doing the, coming up to the Tonight Show. So you remember that? I, that I, you, you, I had to go. I had to go to the doctor and get pads put on because I shingles are bleeding blisters. Painful. Yeah. And I, when I did my first Tonight Show, I had like this pads on my butt cheek and my upper thigh. That's where it broke out on me, mm-hmm. and uh, it was painful. Just painful. Now that, but, but I want you. To, but now remember, you, you're doing this. You're auditioning for Married with Children. You know, yeah. one of the creators is basically trying to shove you down the steps. Okay, <laughs> it's like when you, you know, I'm sitting there going, the, the, the two, the two guys that create the show, you, you know, he's, he's he's hugging on the guy, and he's basically like, so this guy's better than my friend, huh? Hmm, Doctor, e, you know. By the way, if he's listening to this, I just want to say right now, if you were creating another show, well, you were right to get rid of Rich. Uh, <laughs> Rich, he might have been. And uh, the show was a great show for a lot of years. I just want to say that certainly... uh, Rich didn't deserve the, the that spot. Uh, your friend was much better. And I uh, just want to put that out there. Sorry, Rich, I'm a big fan, but uh, I got to think about myself right now. Uh, the hell with Rich Schneider, and uh, that guy was great, whoever he was. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but what I want to say is, is when you, but I want to, I want you to compare the pressure that you felt doing the Tonight Show, because like I said, like the, the young artist doesn't realize how big that is. But now, network. Now you didn't know Fox was going to turn into a big network, but no, you no. did know they were network people. And did you feel anything when you knew the network had showed up? Well, of course. And, mm. and I mean, we, I how would you compare those show, feelings? Taping those shows, I didn't. I, I, I've, I've never felt great as an actor. When I was a stand-up, I was in control of what was going on. Mm-hmm. Not a, you know, not you're in control, but I, mm-hmm. I wrote everything. I decided what what to say, when to say it, I, everything, and I felt comfortable. And I knew I was in the moment. I stayed in the moment. I was in the moment. But when I was acting, it was I was very self-conscious. I started to get better, but I was always self-conscious. You know, I go. You know, it just it was just a different <laughs> feeling. I never had the confidence in the acting that I had when I was doing stand up. Yeah, because I, I just I'm just because I, I I just still remember watching it, and um, <laughs> and I didn't know at the time. Obviously, I, I've learned over the years because uh, I had seen you on some of the other shows, obviously. But then I found out, and I didn't know this, and I'm embarrassed that I didn't know this. Um, yeah, the shows that you wrote for, I didn't know. You know. So you wrote for Roseanne. Yeah. You know, and now that's another big, 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 big show. So what's, the, I mean, how, I mean, was it, was, was it comics but, again? Was it your comic friends? A lot of, a lot of, you had it as Anthony, you had it. I came back. I got, I got heckled by Sean Penn in South Carolina <laughs> and I, I had all my deals were finished. My network development mm-hmm. deals. They mm-hmm. were going to do another pilot for a series with my name on the front of it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, a friend of mine said, you know, everybody likes the way you write, you know, why don't you try to get a job writing for TV? So I just called everybody that I knew that had a TV show at the time, Seinfeld, Tim Allen, Roseanne, I think were the three that I knew. I called and left messages and Roseanne called me back that night. Mm-hmm. I was just looking to lay some groundwork for the following fall. This was like February, whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and nobody was staffing, but I got lucky and Roseanne had just fired a bunch of writers. So she called me up and said, yeah, you got a job. Show up tomorrow at the at the studio, and I had, I started writing, started working, and I didn't know anything about writing sitcoms. At first, I was just punching jokes with other comics. We just would 
if the joke wasn't funny, we'd go in and try to come up with some alternatives that they call it punching up, mm-hmm. up the script or whatever. And that's what I did. And I, I was, I was grateful for the job. I was grateful for the, to be able to learn something. And uh, again, once again, it was a friend, a friend who gave me a job, a comic friend. And that was the same thing with Jeff. Uh, when he, when he wrote Foxworthy. Uh, yeah. With Jeff Foxworthy, yep. same thing. Same thing. I, same thing. Roseanne was winding down. Foxworthy was bringing his show over to this, the same studio over uh, CBS Radford in the Valley. And I, uh, he passed me. I was walking to, you know, something to Roseanne show. I was walking on that lot and Jeff was driving on and he stopped his car and said, Hey, uh, my show's going to be over here next season. You want to write for it? I said, yeah. Like, like, like listen, uh, Jeff, listen, uh, no, I don't want this writing. Why would you waste my time pulling over? You just get back in your car and get, go- no. <laughs> you know, he, he's a, he's a very special guy. He really mm-hmm. is. He's a very confident guy. And a nice guy. He knows who he is. Mm. You know, he took the advice for him when he first started was lose that accent. Nobody's going to hire. You're not going to get a job on television with that Southern accent. And he's like, nah, uh, I'm just going to stick with what I'm doing and who I am. Isn't it weird? It it worked out. Isn't it weird that what what you notice is someone unique comes along. They're special. (laughs) They blow the doors off the place. And instead of going, hey, let's find special, super talented people that are unique. Nah, let's just copy the guy that's do good right now and do sixteen different versions of <laughs> of what you just saw. <laughs> it's like you know, and I'm gonna ask you this: this this I, I, this is the one, Titus. Yeah, I did well, not again the same same thing. I mean, I knew Christopher Titus worked with him on the road, and uh, his show was starting up, and he asked if I'd write on his show, and. Again, the same sort of thing. I mean, maybe my agent submitted it, but he was definitely there when I when I met for the job. And uh, he knew exactly what he wanted his show to be. I mean, Christopher has a very uh, unique awareness of himself and, and his comedic viewpoint. He's a very, very special in that, that way. And he knew it from that show. Mm-hmm. Now, he had battles. Again, they always have battles. You know, Roseanne, fortunately for her, out of the box, she was a number one hit. Mm-hmm. So she could win those battles, you know. But for Christopher, you know, if you don't have the ratings right off the bat, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to get it the way you need that show to be, to work for you. And again, like you said, they see these comics, men and women, and they see them what they do to a crowd. And they know that this is unique. And what they and they go, now we got to make them for TV to change what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> they go, and you just saw, you hired the guy guy or woman you hired them because of their uniqueness like you just said and then they go yeah but now they got to reach everybody middle america is different they gotta we gotta change this and move this yeah, and the funny thing is that's what they want to do but but yeah. what they what they actually do is more along the line of this this is the most delicious apple pie i've ever had in my life we have to find a way to mass produce this because if anyone tastes this apple pie they're going to be a big fan but first dump five pounds of salt on it <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's just it's just an, it's just an amazing thing, and uh, it, I just I just find it fascinating. Now, also, cause like I said, I'm, I I told you before we started recording, I'm going to pick your brain because I want to find out about these things. I warned you before I hit the record button. So <laughs> now you wrote for, and this is this is something I did know, but I was I was curious about it because I expected you to write for sitcoms. I expected th- those things, maybe movies and things of that nature, but what I didn't know. Was you wrote for you wrote for singers like a, a, a Kenny Rogers? Yeah. Um, so you know, uh, I think I got that through Jeff Foxworthy. Kenny uh, said I need somebody to write some you know patterns, the, the jokes in between. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. And um, that's what I did. I didn't write songs. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but but Kenny was unbelievable because he he was living in Vegas. He was working in Vegas, and I was in L.A. And I'd fly in once a week, and I'd spend a night or two, and go over all this material I'd written. And he'd look at it and he'd laugh at some stuff. This is funny. This is good. This is great. And then I'd watch you go on stage. You wouldn't do any of it. <laughs> any of it. Maybe one joke. You know. But every week, big fat check. Big mm-hmm. fat check. And every week he's paying me. And this goes on for a couple of months. My, you know, I mean, it's just, I'm making a lot of money. And mm-hmm. it just goes on and on and on. And finally, I show up one, one week and he goes, Rich, I got a new hit song out. It was something about baseball. I can't mm-hmm. remember what it was. It was something about a kid playing baseball. I got a new hit song. And once I get a hit song, I don't need any different pattern. I use the same jokes. He says, whenever I don't have any hit songs, well, I get nervous. I got to change the jokes. 
But <laughs> when I got a hit song, I don't worry about the jokes. So mm. he just, he goes, thanks a lot. He writes me another big check. I mean, he's, I mean <laughs> seriously, this is a lot of money. And he goes, thank you very much. And uh, you're welcome to stay for the weekend if you want uh, on me, of course. Every, I mean, he was a first class guy. Mm. To me, I had I had money he gave me for, for eating. I eat meals with the guy. It was a first class guy. I mean, very, very nice. But he, he, he just, he was just looking to you know, something to do when he didn't have a hit song. <laughs> Need a new joke. Truth be told, it makes sense because, especially if you're, as you, you know, as a live performer, you know, you would, you gotta, you gotta, you got as you said earlier, you gotta keep those plates spinning, and you gotta do something because, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. he felt like he needed to spruce up his jo show a little bit. I don't know if he ever did any of my jokes. I can't remember. Tell you the truth, not much. If he did, it really wasn't much. It wasn't like when I was writing with Jeff Foxworthy. And mm -hmm. He was if 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 him and I put together ten minutes in the daytime, he tried all ten minutes that night. I mean, you know, it was a, a different um, mythology. It was a different entertainer. Obviously, Jeff's thing is being funny, but but Kenny's was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just, I got a hit song now. <laughs> That's all I needed. <laughs> now, how do you, how do you now? I've never, I've never, I mean, I've given comics jokes, you know, you write some stuff and you're like, I'm never doing this. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, 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 like, yeah, I mean, yeah. this is funny, yeah, but it's never coming of out of my mouth ever. Of course. You know, of course. Of course. so you, as I can hear you talk, are a guy from uh, New Jersey. Yeah. And you're talking to a guy from Philadelphia. Yeah. So we're, so, and, and as you know, uh, it's, you know, are you, uh, what part, are you from South Jersey? North Jersey? Yeah, South Jersey, down by Wilmington, Delaware. Oh, Prince, my God. Town. Okay, so, we're, we're, you know, so basically, we're all, we're pretty much the same. Uh, you know, <laughs> South Jersey, Philadelphia, Delaware, that entire area, we're all the same guys. Um, yeah. So, when you write for Jeff Foxworthy as a dude from New Jersey, <laughs> with, because you know how, first of all, the northeast quarter of the United States, we're a different animal uh, than, than anybody else. You know, yeah, we, we, yeah. We're, we're just, we move. I literally had to teach myself how to talk this slow when I moved out to L.A. in 93 uh, before I moved back because I I have to, for, because I, you know it is, if you and I were across, the, if we weren't doing this show and we were eating dinner, do you know how fast we'd start talking? <laughs> you know, yeah. that's what it would sound like to everybody else. Because we both learned slow down. Yeah. So when you think of New Jersey, New Jersey guy, and you and our sensibilities from this from this area, and now you have to take those jokes. And Jeff Foxworthy is notoriously not from New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. and not from the northeast corridor how do you you know is, is, do you have to literally change the way you, do you just write the joke hey this is funny here jeff or do you have to yeah, change yeah. everything I mean, for him? I mean he obviously any comic if you write a joke for them they have to put it in their own language you mm -hmm. know if i gave a joke to somebody they, they're going to move it into their tempo their phrasing that, that's it. Jeff would do the same thing. He mm -hmm. would take my joke. Now, look, a lot of the jokes um, were about uh, being married, mm -hmm. relationship with your wife. So I had a lot of jokes about that. So it's not like the attitude is different or uh, we're both of the same. Jeff's a couple of years younger than me, but mm -hmm. we're both pretty much the same age, not that much difference. And so it wasn't like a whole generational shift that he had to think about. Mm -hmm. It was just him putting it into his, you know, his Southern uh, uh, language as opposed to my, like you said, you know, fast talking Jersey mush mouth, <laughs> you know? So he had to, he had to like just do a little translation, but mm -hmm. he does it. Every comic does it. If you give him the joke, they edit it to, to fit their tempo and, and they'll, they'll phrase things their way. If I see him doing a special called the Jersey turnpike sucks, I'm going to know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't think so. Is, is think, you ever, you ever yeah. notice how bad traffic circles are? Yeah, but it's, some of the stuff is so universal. It's, <laughs> it's, it's stuff is, you know, he did a joke about, about you know, when guys come in after a long, long trip going somewhere, they always go, I, the first thing they tell you is how fast they got there. Made it in 6 hours and 36 seconds. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then it's like that, that works all over the country because mm. men are the same about that. So, 
a lot of this stuff is just universal. That's what I go. I go for the way people behave. Mm -hmm. I never like making fun or doing jokes about things people can't change. Never mm -hmm. like that. So if it's something in behavior, it's usually the human condition is the same everywhere in the world, really, when it comes down to it. It's the same seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. It's not that it, it, all the same, it's just different way we speak, different way we phrase, different um, you know, colloquialisms or whatever. But you never but you never behaviors. did you never did material that was locked into a specific region. You you had, you know, life no, material. No. Because right. we're because we're doing first of all, there's three networks back mm -hmm. then, and you're trying to reach as many people as possible. It wasn't until the '90s when people started balkanizing it a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, balkanization that I called it, of, mm -hmm. uh, where where people go, look, I don't want to reach everybody. I don't have to reach everybody. I'm just going to reach this segment of society. That's mm -hmm. all I'm going to do. I'm just going to be the Filipino comedian, or I'm going to be the gay comedian, mm -hmm. or I'm going to be, you know, this. You, you know what I mean? So they go, I don't want to try to reach everybody. If I could just get this little segment here, that'd be enough. You know, I'll be the clean comedian or whatever they wanted to be. Yeah, that sort of changed in the '90s, but back in my day, you tried to reach everybody. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I used to get a kick out of the guys that would come to town, or I'd be working with somebody, or I'd have an, a person that was opening for me, and. uh he would find me in the, at the bar, and I'm sitting there just talking to people. And he would come and he goes, and they, 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 you have, you have the uh, the Mad Lib guys, where they come in there, <laughs> and, they, and he goes, "Yes, hey, so, uh, have you played this town before? Yeah, I played this town. Yeah, I played this town like 15 times. Okay, because uh, I don't want to ask anybody here. Uh, what's the tough area? Okay, what's the lottery called? I'm like, oh my god, dude, just do your jokes, bro. <laughs> he, this guy literally he had, he had a clipboard. I'm not even kidding. There was a clipboard. I'm going. You printed up a clipboard with, you know, it was like the tough area and it had the long line with the, with the, with the, yeah, with yeah, the period. Yeah. I'm going, what's, oh my God, yeah, dude. What's the inter, which interstate's the problem in traffic? Which is, you know, back in the day, back in Lenny Bruce's day, mm -hmm. the clubs would have in the dress room, they would leave behind. If you want to make fun of a place to eat, this greasy spoon, this is the diner to say. If you want to make fun of this, they'd have a list of all that mm -hmm. for the comedians to use those local references. Now you think after a while the audience be like, "Yeah, we get it. You're making fun of Joe's Diner again. We get it. We get it. The place sucks. The past, the last fifty comedians have done jokes about Joe's Diner. We get it." The guy wasn't even smooth with it. No. <laughs> he, 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 didn't, he, didn't, no. he, he didn't even know how to slide it. And he goes, "I'm telling you right now, I don't want to get caught in Franklin Street." And we're like, "Oh my god." <laughs> Like, they can read it off the sink. <laughs> Reading off his jacket. It's like we're. In, it was me at the MC. This guy's the feature, and and, and we we're, we're literally in the sound booth laughing our asses off. He thinks he's and he's he's doing okay, but he's like, "What? Is he? Thanks for the heads up." I'm going, uh, yeah, okay. But I, it was just it was just really, it was just really bad, man. I tell you, my wife would definitely not want to buy a dress at the shoe barn. And, oh God, come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was like it was the worst thing ever. But I just I just got a kick out of those guys. Now I want to ask you. I can't, I can't let you go until we. I ask you about the history of comedy. Yeah, what about it? You got to tell me. No, you, <laughs> it's, you, a long, it's a long. It's a look. I, I'm doing a show. Mm -hmm. That's really what I'm talking about. about mm -hmm. I talk about. I talk about. You know how it changed over the years. Who started it? I talk about. Um, the line, you know, there's always a line. Things you can say and things you can't say in public. There's always been that line, and the best comics. They, they dance on that line. They have to go over to find that line and they dance on it. It changes all the time. The line's invisible. It's always changing. I talk about that. There's always been PC culture. There's always been cancel culture. Mm -hmm. There's always been the, these things. And I talk about it. I talk about how things change in, for, for women in comedy or how things change. I mean, either change uh, any, any aspect of comedy, how it changed and what it said about America. Because if comics are great, the comics who, who are, you know, who are big at the time, they hit the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. They hit it perfectly because you can tell what America cares about by what they're laughing about. You can tell what they're afraid of by what they're laughing about, or what they're obsessed with, what America's obsessed with. You can tell by what the comedians are doing at that time. So that's what the show It's a very funny show. I do jokes. I talk about every comic from the first comic, not every comic, but every mm -hmm. the big changes, the game changers, the ones that you, you know, um, uh, over the years, I talk about them and, and what they said about America. Yeah, it, it's really weird because I, I, um, I, I just, I, I just love the art form. You know, I mean, it's it's, it's one of the yeah, things where yeah. where it's like, I mean, when you you can tell a person loves the art form. I mean, think, I mean, think about the late uh, artist Prince. He's he's playing basketball stadiums and stuff, and he'd go to a nightclub and play again. 
You know, it's just like, yeah. you know yeah. who you are, yeah. buddy. You, you're playing basketball. And then he's playing this. And it's the same thing. No matter how big a comic gets, no matter how much money you have in the bank, you will find that guy or that gal sometime, somewhere at a small club somewhere with a notepad under their arm telling jokes just like it, they did before they pulled up in a Tesla. <laughs> you know, that's and, and that's the thing that I love about the art form. It's just we are no matter how successful comics get. Um, in my estimation, I think that we are, as far as artists are, con- are concerned, we're the closest to, even if we become highly some ultra star or something like that, we are very close to the college basketball player that knows he's not going to the NBA, but still loves playing basketball. You know, he knows that these two guys are going to go to the NBA. He's not but he still plays basketball. He still dives on the floor. He's still at the rec center playing basketball. He's a lawyer. He's a doctor, you know, and he still does it. Granted, we can still go to the NBA at 60, 70, 80, because all we need is one, one hit film, one good spot on television, uh, <laughs> one viral video. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're 94 years old. Hey, it's grandpa. Ha ha. He's the hottest comic in the country. Grandpa. Ha ha. 65 billion hits on YouTube. Because, a lot of the, everybody that I know that's still doing it after all this time, no matter what the level of success, loves the art form so much that they can't stop doing it, and they love every second of it. That's yeah, what I love. It's, about it's an original time. American art form. Mm-hmm. I think there are only two performance art forms that are originally American. I think jazz music and stand up comedy. I think, and um, stand up comedy is an original American art form. We started it, and just like jazz, we exported it all over the world. I mean, you're, there are people, I met this young woman does stand-up comedy in Pakistan. I mm-hmm. met I met a guy on the internet who's a Moroccan stand-up comic. Now, they had different ways they have to do it, and they may have more censorship than we have, mm-hmm. but it's an American art form. And one person, you know, going on stage just to try to make a live audience laugh. That's it. That's basically it. Now, one last thing before I let you go, and really, thank you for coming on. You know, this is, uh, you know, like I said, been a fan since the, in the Canyon Man days, man. I, I'm an original. OK, I didn't come on after HBO one night stand. I was there from the beginning. <laughs> damn it. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you did. What do you think about? I mean, like right now, I mean, because uh, you're on Facebook, but you're not on some of these other things. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's like. It, uh, you know, I yeah, mean, I, I, you know, I know the social media. I mean, I don't work Twitter and I don't work Instagram, really. I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I put anything on either one. Of them. I go on to see my friends and put a little story or something on Facebook once in a while, but I don't work social media. Yeah, cause Maybe I, to my detriment. I don't know, but I'd rather spend my time doing something else. That's all. Yeah. I don't have a lot of, you know, it's not like I got when you're 20, man. When I was 20, you know, I slaughtered time like Buffalo. <laughs> you know, I wasted time all sorts of ways. As you get older, you go. I'm not putting my time here. I'm going to put it here. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's just it's just a time weird. management. It's, it's a weird. Short. It's just it's just a, it's a. I was an adult when the internet started. Um, by, as yeah, my as my yeah, nephews would yeah. say, ha 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 ha, back right down the steps, ha ha ha, right to the living room, and uh, yeah. and I I I understand it, but I I, I to me it is they're doing it's kind of a tool and kind of like you know like a little hobby type thing for me, even though I oh, use it for a, stuff. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. a marketing tool, no doubt about it it's a good marketing tool yeah but this i didn't get into this business for money and it's been working out so far <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah oh i can relate to that you know i know i know that i know those 20 dollar yeah. checks that you yeah. get that you get in new york and la here's 20 <laughs> bucks punk get out <laughs> you know i know those feelings <laughs> mr scheidner mr rich scheidner i want to thank you for coming on this is a blast thank i you, knew man. it was going to be a blast i was looking forward to it that's why i asked you back then and uh Still a big I fan. Now I'm actually that. a bigger fan now, having met you, than I was when I started. And I want to thank you for coming on, my brother. Thanks, S. Anthony. Thank you, man. Okay, take care, my friend. All right, bye. All right, now that was fun, wasn't it? Told you. What did I tell you? Have I failed you yet? No. Will I fail you? Also, no. Thanks again for all your support. Much love to everybody, and I'll see you again next time. Take care.